Welcome to Small Spark Theory. This podcast is designed as a collection of thoughts, ideas and practical tips on using marginal gains to help your agency new business endeavours. Small Spark Theory is created and hosted by me, Lucy Mann of Gunpowder Consulting. Welcome back to Small Spark Theory. We are delighted to have with us today one of our previous contributors, Erica Wolf Murray from Lola Media. Welcome, Erica. Thank you. Now, when we chatted earlier in the year, we were discussing how agencies can better understand their intellectual assets. And as part of that discussion, we touched on the subject of revenue models. And we discussed at the time, actually, it made sense to come back and revisit that and talk about that in a bit more detail. And it seems like an ideal time to have that discussion, um, particularly that recently we had Blair Enns talking mm-hmm. about his book on pricing. So we've, we've covered some of those ideas about different ways to think about value. So yes, I'm looking forward to a, a really interesting discussion around revenue models. So as a bit of context, you've been writing a book. And as part of that book, you've identified, I think, over 50 different revenue models that are being used in the creative industries? Yes, it it sort of started as an exercise for this book. I was looking at talking about money and finances. And as I sat down and wrote this, I thought, ooh, how many different revenue models am I going to refer to through here? And as it began to evolve into a list, the list got longer. And I identified that even when I was having sort of small transactions about buying a cup of coffee, you know, what you're buying is something that somebody spent time preparing. So you're buying it at the very end of the value chain. And I started to write this list of all the different ways I could see businesses around me, businesses I was involved with, businesses in the creative industry, all the different ways they had of making money. And I slowly built up this list of 50 that I refer to quite regularly when I'm working with design companies, with ad agencies, thinking, are there different ways that they could make money? Mm. Some overlap and are very close to each other, whereas others are, you know, very, very different Mm. and poles apart. Were there any in there that were particularly surprising to you that were completely left to field? I think the notion about being rewarded for success and looking at how that might translate to you know, ad agencies, design companies. I Mm. mean, if you're running a TV production company, your reward for success is that you own the documentary, the film, the drama that you produce, Mm. and you can sell it around the world. So you get a second chance to make income further down the line, where a lot of the businesses that we work in, the creative industries, Mm. you don't get that second bite at the cherry. Mm. So looking at models like rewards for success, it gives you a real incentive to work very well and very hard for your client, but that you actually then get literally that reward for the success, whatever that looks like. Now, it could be a lifetime value, it could be, you know, beating KPIs, all sorts of different things. But it really is a, a way of extending the value of what you do. Okay. I mean, we know that the majority of agencies largely sell time. Yes. And that causes all kinds of headaches. It's a killer. Yeah. It really is. It's a killer on so many different fronts. Um, Not only often when you're working really, really hard and you're selling your time, you're not marketing. You come to the end of a project, you know, you have no work to go to. You've got to keep on doing the marketing whilst you're doing the do. And it's horrible. You can only sell your time once. You can only multiply your time by the amount of people you've got working for you, you know, and it is very hard to scale a business like that on that model if that's what you want to do. So, When I start working for clients, I absolutely know that they're going to have that as one of their models. But we try and develop three, four, five other revenue streams on different structures Mm. to ensure that comes into the business as well. That gives them much greater resilience, which is something, you know, you and I've talked Mm, about a lot mm. that we come back to. How can you make companies resilient and by having several revenue streams? You know, that is absolutely a surefire way of building that in. Okay. And actually, thinking back to our conversation with Tony Wolford from Green Square in the last episode, I'd imagine if an agency has 
other revenue models that they've implemented successfully beyond just selling their time, then that's got to be more attractive to an acquirer. I think it does, yes. And the other thing not to forget is, you know, if you're earning income in all sorts of different ways, it's attractive to clients. It's also attractive to staff. Yes. Because if you're doing all sorts of different things, if your day is creative, inventive, you're not just working away, you know, to deliver one particular thing, it can make the the whole atmosphere of an agency, of a design company, really vibrant. Great. My observation, and we've talked about this before, is that certainly the smaller agencies seem to suffer the most from that roller coaster of revenue and struggle the most to be able to implement a sustainable new business and marketing program because they they haven't got the number of people. And I know we're going to come on and talk about your book, but your book is particularly aimed at businesses of 10 people and less. It is. And I think you've identified a really key point, which is that the fact that it is so hard for com- for very small companies to market to do the work as well and to constantly have a full funnel and that even though it can be tricky for them to get onto a multiple revenue model system actually it's hugely beneficial mm. for them because if they can get the right structures in place to allow that to happen they then can ease out of the hamster on the wheel model mm. um and They have very close relationships with a lot of their clients. And if they can sit down and say to their client, look, just being paid for time really doesn't work for us because it's too it's too dangerous. How else can we structure revenues out of the work that you give us, the work that we help you do? How can we become a creative partner rather than in this parent child relationship that most agencies are in Mm. to, to try and build new ways of working and thinking about how they can be paid it becomes really a very interesting conversation and also it allows their businesses to grow in quite interesting and different ways too and often in ways they haven't expected and you're absolutely right I realized that there was a huge huge gap in the market for a supportive business book aimed at micro businesses Mm. there are five million companies that have less than 10 employees and then there's a further 4.6 million people who are working freelance who are effectively running their own thing or they've got a side hustle going Mm. on but none of the focus for business support business help at all addresses these particular companies Mm. now i'm not really talking about startups i'm not so much talking about entrepreneurs i'm talking about companies that have been doing the do for three five or whatever years Mm. and actually are really looking to grow and there's just loads of them and nobody is holding out that hand to them saying Mm. you know what does growth look like for you and many 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 of these are in the creative industries so what are the first steps that they can start to take to try and understand how they can move away perhaps from a a model that is just selling time to explore some other areas? One of the really first things they can do is to look at their brief, the brief that they get given by a client because any client will have some KPIs in there, Mm. some key performance indicators or what they want as an outcome. Now, you can very, very easily say, well, if we do the work with you and we outperform what you've set us Mm. as a challenge you know please could you pay us some additional reward you know back to my rewards for success Mm. could you pay us some additional reward for this Mm. because at the end of the day that's the work that they've got in today so you might as well use that of course there are then other ways of saying well what 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 other assets have we got within the business that you can evolve into different revenue streams so you know, that's something that you could do with your present clients. But what else could you offer your future clients? Mm-hmm. You know, could you offer them business growth advice? Can you package things up slightly differently? Could you help them evolve, you know, an animated character? Could you license something to them so that you don't sell them the intellectual property of what you do? You license it to them and go, you know, if we re- if it returns to us after six months a year you know we could sell it on to other companies obviously you know under 
commercial confidentiality, we could sell it on to other companies and then we could, you know, share the revenues, the back end split of that. So there are just so many different ways of looking at money, at looking at deals, at looking at opportunities. Mm. It's really sort of opening up your mind and going, how can we do this in completely different ways so we are not stuck on that time model? When you say it like that, it sounds a really exciting... It's fun. <laughs> a really exciting it process. It is fun. So starting off the process with your agency head, who's probably being kept awake at night, worrying about this, maybe particularly this time of year when things can be a bit quiet and they're wondering whether or not the pipeline, there's enough in the pipeline. How do you manage to get them into that different headspace to really start thinking creatively about the other other options for driving revenue? One of the really really basic ways to do it is to help them understand different businesses so Mm. you know take somebody completely unrelated to your own business I know Mm. take Tesco or take an insurance company or something some organization that you may just trip over in your day-to-day life Mm. and look at how they do it Mm. and go well if they can do it why can't I do it you just have to understand there are ways to make money at every turn Mm. in our lives and you don't just have to be stuck on one why Mm. why stick in a groove when there are just opportunities around the place at every turn Mm. and you know think about all the different clients you've got what could you be doing for them they're coming to you with a certain amount of needs, briefs that they need that, that that require fulfilling. But actually, what are they then going to do further down the line with the work that you're doing? Can you take a cut in that? Mm. Can you identify other things that you do within the company that actually might have a market in a different place? Mm. For example, I'm working with one design company at the moment, and they've developed a huge amount of online tools for their different clients. And I'm looking at how they can then pull them back into their ownership, Mm. develop a toolkit and a way of working that they can take out to the particular sector. They've got a lot of experience Mm. Mm. globally and Mm. say, here's a toolkit that we know works. We can use it in a number of different ways for your organisation, but it can be replicated 50, 60, 70, 80 organisations None of them will ever produce the same type of work out of the tools, yeah. but it builds value for all of them. Yeah. yeah. So again, it's, you know, what can you replicate and sell in different marketplaces? Excellent. Excellent. One of the areas I've seen increasingly, particularly in design, is where agencies, when they're working with startups, are getting involved in taking some kind of equity mm-hmm. stake or sweat equity in yeah. it, rather than charging out on time. Have you seen that working particularly well or what, what, what should an agency be cautious of? I, because I know I know some agencies have done it. I know some agency owners are quite cautious of getting involved in those arrangements. I think for me, I always say to a company, don't get involved in sweat equity okay. um, with startups. Why? Because you're probably not the best person to identify whether this is going to be a success. Mm. And the place that that might go is, you know, down the pan very quickly. And you've spent a lot of time, a lot of effort on it, and it actually hasn't gone anywhere. What I always say to companies, if they do want to get involved in startups or early stage companies, that they value their time properly. They do a proper quote for it. They know within that price what the value of their actual overheads are and what the profit is and always try and get the money to cover the overheads and then there's a differential and then they can work out what they do with that sort of the profit sector in that job and you know there are all sorts of interesting models that you can do with how that company then makes up that differential but I always go for cash for that for that overhead model because otherwise you you know you've lost money before you've started and you're not going to see anything back from that sweat equity for two, three, four, five years down the line, yeah. if at all. If at all. I think, yeah, that makes sense. So if, you, if you've if you got a really robust model already for doing that and you know how you're going to structure it and what you're going to get out of it or what, mm. you, what you should get out of it, then that's fine. But if you're doing it because somebody's pushing back on budget, yeah. then be wary yeah and then and cut your cloth according to the money they've got yeah i completely understand why people want to do it Mm. but i warn them off 
yeah. the whole time. Yeah. You know, there is this phrase, lost leader. Mm, I've never seen lost leaders that lead anywhere other than losses. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, I won't take that as a as a reason for doing anything. <laughs> Good. Good advice. Good advice. You heard it here first. So what kind of changes have you observed in the way that businesses are buying services? Has there been a shift in in the way that they work with suppliers? I think that there's the obvious, you know, the, the obvious changes that management consultants are now coming in, that a lot of clients are pulling things in-house. But equally, you know, when that happens, there are also new buyers in the market. So, mm. you know, there are some companies that potentially are revolutionising different markets. And, you know, those are always interesting places to go and find new business and ways of working. And often what's fascinating about those sorts of disintermediation companies is that they're really open to different revenue models. Yes, yes. Because they've done it themselves. Yes. So these are what I call in the sort of five areas of opportunity these are the new buyers class you know they are really really interesting to go and talk to about inventive revenue models because boy have they had to come up with some themselves so you you're often getting venture capital money in there you're often getting people who've emerged from big industry want to start up and you know do something very different in a market that they know so they are using really really inventive models themselves Mm. and are quite happy to work with a company that goes you know we want to challenge the models around um, what we're being charged for so that's really interesting and I, i i guess thinking about your where you can test some of that thinking with existing clients or prospects is an interesting way of looking at it because i think you're right in those sectors that have been challenged either the the established players are, are having to rethink or there are challenges coming into those sectors uh, who are shaking things up. So, you, uh, yeah, that makes complete sense that those are the areas where you may be able to get a bit more traction than perhaps some of those sectors. I'm thinking probably FMCG is still quite... Well, you know, if you think about, let's look at, you know, the shaving market with mm. Shave Club or, you know, let's look at the mattress buying market, which seems mm. to be hot at the moment. If you are working with an organisation like that that is absolutely out to disrupt the status quo, Mm. if you can say to them, yeah, we'll do the work, we'll take our fee, but actually for every single purchaser that you get above the numbers that you've asked for, if we get sales from them, we'd like X or we'd like um, a share of dividend. We'd like... There are so many different ways you can Mm. be rewarded. It doesn't just have to be a bit of cash. It can be what's the opportunity that they could open for you you know if they start a subsidiary business do you say you want to be pole position to pitch for a subsidiary business there are so many different ways that you can look at being rewarded that isn't just about being paid for for time for time and i'm a tiny business and i'm paid in about five or six different ways i always charge a fee for the pro- i don't base it on time i base mm. it on a project Without mm. exception, yeah. I charge a fee for that. Yeah. But I am paid in a number of different ways mm. for different things that I do. And it didn't happen overnight, but I absolutely knew that that's how I wanted to run my business because I just, if I was sick and I couldn't work and do my paid hours, mm. I didn't want to be com- always paid by that. Yeah. So, Erica, tell us a bit more about the book. When's it available? Well, the book's due out in January but will be available to pre-order, we think, from the end of September up on Amazon. It's been a bit of a roller coaster because, of course, this is now, this is a separate income stream for me. I'm trying to practice what I preach. The contents of the book actually came from the contents of 26 notebooks that I had written, mapping all my meetings with all of my clients, all the diagrams I use, all the models I use, and including the list of revenue streams. And um, one day I said, I'm going to write a book. And of course, I said it out loud. So then I had to 
actually got to deliver do it, it. <laughs> yeah. which was sort of part of the plan. And the notes took me the longest time, the notes from all these notebooks, and writing it was quite quick. And I'm self-publishing because even though it was liked by five different publishing houses, nobody actually took it. So I'm, I'm self-publishing, but at the end of the day, that gives you more control and it means that you can put in it what you want mm. and you can ensure it has the values that you want. So instead of being their content or their illustrators or whatever, I've had some great designers working on it. So yes, it comes out early next year, which is when apparently everybody buys business books. Is it right? Well, it, it, obviously, it's a it's a real labour of love, and we we really look forward to reading it. We'll be ordering advance copies. But the good news for our listeners is that Eric is kindly going to give away a copy of the book for one of our lucky listeners. So. In time honoured tradition, if you join in the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Small Spark Theory and tweet us at Gunpowder Tweets, uh, we will pick a winner and make sure you are signed up to receive a copy of Erica's book. Um, give us the title again, Erica. It's called Simple Tips, Smart Ideas, Easy to Use Advice for Business Growth. Brilliant. Well, we'll we'll pick a winner, and you'll um, you'll have your copy of the book coming out to you in January after the launch Erica you've been insightful as always thank you so much for your time and um, no doubt we'll see you again in another episode thank you very much thanks for listening today we've had an enjoyable time here even though there's been two helicopters some jet washing and a man with a cleaning trolley trundling past so if there was a bit of disruption along the way thanks for bearing with us we'll be back again next month where we'll be talking to the head of new business and pr from adam and eve you have been listening to small spark theory brought to you by gunpowder consulting join in the conversation on twitter at gunpowder tweets hashtag small spark theory The podcast is created and hosted by me, Lucy Mann. Our editor is Claire Urban and our producer is Isabel Jarvis. Music is provided by Duke Deck, available at dukedeck.com. For more information and to download further episodes, head to our blog at gunpowderconsulting.com. And if you like what you hear, head to iTunes and leave us a star.